Hello, I'm Brad. And I'm Jason. You are listening to Dice, Dice in, in My Mind. So we have an interesting show this week. Um, we're going to have um, Jason do an interview with um, Jason. You call him a, uh, is it a polymorph? A polymath. Uh, polymath. Thank you. He's not, he's not a changeling. Sorry, no, Rob. Um, I don't think so. But I consider it a, a renaissance man. It's a very interesting um, interview within this episode, about 15 to 20 minutes. If you want to hear one of the coolest worlds and since we're talking about world building yeah if you want to do hear about one of the coolest worlds being gamed right now just so listen, creative yeah listen carefully to that interview and and let me even you've recorded this already before we've recorded right. this episode right. so so rob thank you i found that extraordinarily fascinating um and again folks listen carefully as to how he has um created this world for friends and mm-hmm. what this world encompasses mm-hmm. and i'll trans i'll kind of use that as a as a movement over to us to who the fact that last week um we're going to put the link to this again in this episode yep yep jason a while back you in effect diagrammed out a world building model and mm-hmm. um I had mentioned when you sent this, this, you had sent this long before we were even recording. Oh, yeah. Um, and I said, this has got to be a way if we're going to do something on our own. And yep. we were talking about fate and other things at the mm-hmm. time. This, this is the most, um, this provides a context for gaming, whether you are a player or whether you are a DM in a way that I've never right. seen it before. So, Again, I say it last time, I say it this time, kudos to you. Last episode, we talked about the factors. Mm -hmm. The main factors, economic, cultural, and political. And then within economic, you have trade and travel. Within cultural, you have academics and media. And within political, exploration and military. I would recommend, folks, I really believe this. Listen to the last episode. Mm -hmm. It's really starting to tee each other up. Yep. Today, we'll talk about is a is an interlude you know before and a little bit after our inter, our interview with rob exploration interaction and combat and those right. are the mechanics which is really one of the things ironically that's our um, that's in our for lack of a better term i use a business term for this so that's our that's the mission statement for right the podcast for dice and mind yeah 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 absolutely it's 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 not all about mechanics but we we wanted to do this podcast because we want to geek out around, sorry, we wanted to provide critical analysis around mechanics and real life and the hybridization with games. Um, and, and so again, it's, yeah, we're coming full circle. And, and just to be really honest, right. We, we all know that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And we also know, according to both Solomon and Einstein, there's nothing new under the sun. So all the ideas in, in our model to aid world building, they are all not novel, terrible grammar, but it makes the point, right? We we've taken what we've seen in really good sources elsewhere and try to integrate that into a model that just selfishly, Brad, you and I can use and are going to use to help guide us through our own game design. And like you said, last time we talked about the factors. If you haven't listened to that, everyone, please do go back because like Brad said, it's, it's really important for making sense of what's coming this week and next week. But this week, right now, we want to talk about the quote unquote mechanics, not the dice mechanics, but the broader game mechanics bordering on narrative kind of you know brad i think of these mechanics as sitting at the intersection of the dice and the story and how you translate back and forth between them and and i just want to be clear these three mechanics i think are fairly universal what really got me going Mm -hmm. to finish this model if you will was reading one of the developer blog posts i think from from wizards for dnd and 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 just they talked about three similar mechanics and they they were reiterative of what i'd seen elsewhere and and so 
So that's what we're talking about, everybody. Just these three basic mechanics, exploration, interaction, combat. In other words, what a PC or an NPC can do in a game. And what should a DM or GM, depending upon mm-hmm. your game, mm-hmm. what should they look at in effect to build a good environment? I mean, for me, when Jason sent this to me again, um, as we were prepping to talk about this idea of world building, he doesn't know this, but we both, I, I, use, I use multiple platforms, um, technology platforms, but I've yeah. become a real fan of um, using a certain app on the, on the Mac OS notes mm-hmm, for my mm-hmm. brainstorming. And so I, in effect, took, I use OneNote to track all of our gaming stuff. Right. But for quick note-taking, I took the exploration, interaction, and combat mechanics. And then I started to overlay um, the, D, the D&D game I'm playing. And that's where I saw a deficiency on the combat side. And as a result of that, a deficiency on the reward side. Um, yeah. And we'll get into that in a minute. But I yeah. use this. And again, like you said, you know, you can go to other places and they'll talk about it. They'll use different terminology mm-hmm. potentially, but I think what us getting around to this idea of world building, I think we couldn't have done it. This is you, you um, uh, in effect telling, you know, not telling me, but you kind of saying, you know, trust me on this. And you were right. Talking about fate right before instead of skipping over pathfinder and fate and talking about oh, this right talking about pathfinder and fate and then this because yes. now if you look at them if you if you if you look at this this is attached on mm-hmm. our to our pages if you look at this you can see how this would work whether it's in sci-fi whether it's right. real world the world mm-hmm. that you're going to hear about with rob what mm-hmm. we're going to be talking about with star trek mm-hmm. and as a d as a a game master, dungeon master, whatever it is. Um, look at this as you're building. Now, yeah. I would bet the Matthew Mercers and everyone out there can do this with their eyes closed. Yeah, they're probably, I was going to say they're probably listening. They're not. But in yeah. our fantasy life, they're probably listening like, ha, 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 such children and their ideas. Yeah, <laughs> amongst the thousands upon thousands of other listeners we have. Right. Um, right. In, right. Again, in our own mind. Yeah. Um, but for those of us who aren't full on gamers yet one or two people like us who really wanted to get behind the game itself and look at ironically the mechanics mm-hmm. this is a model that you can use and apply i can apply it to any of the gaming systems that i have on my bookshelf down here yeah yeah and see how they work so talk to me cuz you you kind of de- you design this in a way just based off of your reading um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of tee you up on this to start. Cause you can, you can elaborate on these better than I can, um, talk a bit from exploration to combat in terms of the mechanics and what you see yeah. with those and what are the underlying themes? Yeah. Okay. And now I'm all of a sudden I'm interviewing again, interviewing you again. And it wasn't, it's not meant to be that way. It's, it's, we're trying oh, new ways to transition rather than to, uh, you know, use, uh, terrible methods and and uh, right like like ordering food at george webb's of just grunting and pointing which doesn't translate well on a well well bear in mind now if people are actually listening to this outside of our location they're not going to know what george webb's is so i'm just not going to worry about that because the likelihood no well I'm just yeah. <laughs> no but think of it think of it as an old diner think of like yeah. alice alice think of it as a as a alice really diner. old school in and out or hot and now but worse Okay. So yeah, anyways. moving on. Yeah. Moving on. So, yeah. So these mechanics, so I, uh, you know, Brad, I really think, well, like you said, I think that these general mechanics tend to be present in most, if not all games, certainly all of the good ones. And, and like, like you said, isn't it nice? Cause I think you're right. It's nice that we, that we talked a bit about fate and pathfinder to round out our list. Okay. So let's actually just take a moment there. So, okay, catch me if I'm wrong here, Brad, in case I'm forgetting or skipping one. We have, over the past umpteen sessions, we've talked a bit or a lot about D&D, one in five versions, mm-hmm. yeah. Pathfinder, 
fate. Two versions. Right, yep. right. Fate, uh, Star Wars, actually a little bit two versions. We still have to circle back to the D6. Yeah. Uh, and Star Trek. Okay, yep. Star Trek Adventures. The, okay. The, so, the 2D20 Star the Trek. 2D20, Logifius. right. And then we did talk a bit about D6 Star Wars, but also the narrative, the FFG the Dice narrative Games. version. Right. Yes. So yes. we've we've purposely worked through what we consider some of the major RPGs out there. Yes, yes, we know, listeners, that there are lots and lots of others that are as or even more popular. We're not saying we're never going to get to Warhammer. We're not saying we're never going to get to something Lovecraftian. But but for right now, with, with our interest between the two of us, Brad, we've we've kind of covered our gamut, if you will. And, well, and plus, I don't think we are allowed to buy any more books at the moment just because of all the other purchases we've made this year. So we can't really talk a, about them until we actually a, buy them. A you know? fact that my wife reminded me of the other day when I got a book on sale and she's like, you know, <laughs> when you got the car, you told me you were going to lay off the books. And I'm like, uh-huh. So yeah, right. That's what I, I, yeah. I got, I got it. Upstairs you got the same thing. Was, yeah, yeah. Very similarly, like yep. yet another Amazon package. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So, okay. So I, we digress, but, mm-hmm. but the point being, so we've covered, intentionally a broad gamut of games a broad gamut of of game settings of dice mechanics of assumptions however i think we would both agree that these three key mechanics exploration interaction combat are present in all of them to significant extent i have found reading dnd and pathfinder materials um, the game master guides, if you will, as well as is what they just put out on their websites, right? The developer type things, the the uh, the the comments by their writers and editors, whatnot. That's. I mean, I'm gonna interrupt for one yeah. sec because I think that is a big thing that that has been brought to gaming because of the internet age. Big play testing and public discussion of play testing. Oh, you can yeah. see it out on Reddit. You can see it all over the place. The de- the developers blogs oh. talking about what they're talking about. Like we, you and I have talked about Unearthed Arcana for D and D for Five E. You know, a lot of people have talked about it. There's yep. development material and discussion material out there. So the fact that we have that makes this discussion all the more interesting. Oh, I mean, compare this. Compare this to the original quote unquote beta testing that Gygax did when he was first writing. D and D one E in his basement with a jam packed room full of twenties and thirties, pasty white guys, all from similar backgrounds with pocket protectors and very poor social skills. Yes. I'm making an exaggeration maybe, but now you compare that to, yeah, to the scope that these games have in their development and how many people can test them, how many voices can weigh in like like um, I actually, I sent you and some of the others a, a text on this uh, several days ago, early this week, but, and talk about a loose thread here, but I read an article about a group of rabbis around the country that during the pandemic yes. have started playing D&D. And, and here's my point about that. And they've decided to reject and instead create their own adaptation in place of having races according in DD because as rabbis uh, from across perspectives they agreed that the notion that any given race or peoples orcs and goblins could be evil was against their belief system and their notion of the universe so they just wrote it out and wrote something else in and i think that's what you're talking about it's this it's this ability to design these games and to get feedback at a level that you know pre-interweb you never could have done no and you're going to hear again i'm i'm yeah plugging it i'm self-plugging you're going to hear this in the yeah you are you're going to hear this exact thing in the interview because of how he it it is such an um, um, amalgamation of different genres and different worlds i mean literally jason you were he recorded it he pinged me that he had recorded it i listened to it that that night and i think i texted back to you in terms of creativity and development i said i am an infant oh Um, yeah right there with you yeah so 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 now that all of our listeners 
know how my daughters as well as my students feel. 15 minutes later, I'm going to try to answer your question which is actually really straightforward. Might as well get there eventually. Mm -hmm. Exploration, interaction, combat. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think this takes very heavily from D&D and Pathfinder only because in their writings and their bloggings, they have been more, uh, more revealing. They pulled back the curtain, right? They've, they've talked to the fourth wall more, I think, than the other games. Okay, so the notion is that in any game, it, it might not be in every session, but in every campaign or, or game as a whole, PCs, NPCs, whatnot, ought to have opportunities for, for interaction. That's not a fair word. I, I realize that I'm, I'm co-opting that from our list, but there ought to be ways for a PC, and, and because of that, for players to move through and experience the game. And they're different, but they're highly interactive. Exploration. A, a, lot, of, a lot of gaming, Brad, is exploring. Like, like uh, you think of the quick start guide for Star Trek Adventures, and it's, it's a tutorial guide, lovely, really well written. Lots of fun just for reading, but it's largely exploratory because that's the, that's the vibe of Star Trek. Like recently... Uh, a Boimler in a Lower Decks episode while being shot at by Packlids. Long story, you got to watch the show. It's hilarious. Uh, he says to the Titans bridge crew, actually, no, I didn't join Starfleet to go pew, pew, pew at people. I joined it because I wanted to explore and discover. Well, a lot of games have that, some more than others. You look at what you're doing with the vastness in the game you're GMing for me, and so much of the game has been my player with the aid of your NPC is trying to figure out what's going on. Pure exploration. It's, it's it, you know, with Star Trek, you could be exploring planets. Um, you could be exploring different species in our game or in d d it, it could be a, something as simple as a dungeon crawl. You're exploring right. in a dungeon right. crawl. Yeah. You know, I look at any of my games and I could see if it was purely just interaction and combat, um, it's too much. Well, I, yeah, it's, you know, it's just it's not it's not balanced, and I think I think we'll get to the point, but there has to be some balance there. Yeah, and that's a really good way to put it, I think, because it's about balance, right? So you've got exploration. Sometimes that's hot, and sometimes it's not. It depends on the purpose of the campaign. It depends on the purpose of of the session. It depends on the story of of the game. Then, like you said, you got interaction. This is PC to PC. PC to NPC, right? As part of the world building. Like, I think in, in your case, Brad, you like it's been obvious to me over our sessions together in, in your game, in our game, that the NPCs are being leveraged increasingly on your behalf in character, still waiting for voices, but in mm -hmm. character to teach my PC about the world right yep, yep. okay that's it that's exactly yep. and that was the whole point of it i mean right. obviously we have to introduce your sidekick but yeah this is um, such a good sidekick. you know yeah. the, the this idea was um D, &D duet there's a website out right. there for it and so i thought well you know this will give me a chance to be creative but we needed we needed a vehicle to help mm -hmm. drive these mechanics um and so i'm playing npcs as best as i am able Mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. PCs, yeah. even as the DM, as a vehicle to make it an interesting environment for, mm -hmm. for Jason's character. So, but that being said, and I'm going to back off on this. I said mm -hmm. this before I built, I built, I did world building. And when I did that, I plagiarized from other areas. Of course. And in the context of building, I'm not publishing this. Right. I'm, I'm not doing anything that's copyright infringement. I'm taking material that's very good and applying it because I wanted to build a balance of these. There's nothing so beautiful as homebrew, whether it's yeah. a P, whether it's an RPG or, or a computer. Yep. Absolutely. So with the interactions then, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human PCs. Well, excuse me, players, whether your PC is a Klingon or a Cardassian or an Ugnaught or a paladin or an orc it doesn't it doesn't matter as players maybe aside for that one guy at your table we're all human and 
we all have a need, some desire to interact with each other. And I would assume most of us want to play tabletop RPGs because in those character character interactions, you can simply have these experiences you can't have in real life. Like I don't know about your your lightsaber wielding skills, Brad. In real life, mine are rather poor. But but you know when I played a Jedi back in the day when Scott GM'd, once I learned as a PC not to drink or lose limbs, he could really fight. Mine's a head. You got it. All right. So that that brings us to combat, sadly. But before you do that, did I hear did I hear a a fifth element reference in there with Ugnots? No, or... are, the, no, the Ugnots are the oh, Ugnot is of the, the name of what are yeah. you thinking? I'm in fifth element. I love there's a one. character and his name is Ugnot. Not a not a species. It's the oh. you know, it's a it's one of the main characters. It's the leader of that. Well, we won't get into it. Yeah, it's just I, when you said no, that, funny, I, heard... though, I was just thinking, I was just thinking of the fifth element the 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 other day and my two favorite lines are first multipass right that just comes in when traveling too often (laughs) Uh, though i I intentionally don't use that at airports or anywhere with their security and the other one is i know this music (laughs) which i think is just the best line okay we okay yeah but again you're making my point because that's interaction that's character development through the narrative okay now speaking of losing limbs combat Obviously, I, I think obviously, Brad, all, I'm going to say it, all RPGs to some extent have combat. Now, now maybe that combat is more like cerebral or at the sabak table, but let's face it, a lot of us got into these games or returned to these games because it's just fun sometimes to act without real world consequence. Right. I mean, that's that's didn't you, didn't you tell me that you were speaking of which did I hear during the interview or I'll tease the interview um, something in there about you wearing chain mail. So did you try combat in real life? Is that what the chain Almost. Mail was? Or, OK, I actually. Okay. Uh, so Rob and I at the college, we had another another colleague who as his pastime. Uh, I, I, I'm going to say this wrong, but as a pastime, did metalwork, and and was into D and D, and um, and I don't think he was into cosplay. No, he I, maybe I don't think so. There are people but, that reenact when we were yeah. At thank you. Together, that, yes, that, thank you. They did actual reenactment. So of right, but I mean, fantasy world yeah. battles. Yeah, but you, you know, usually you don't have your professor in the lounge of one of the buildings who's wearing chain mail while playing D and D with students, which I thought was awesome. And I walked out and, and he's like, you want to try it on? And it's like, yeah, I want to try it on. I, I mean, come on. That's where, when do, when do we get to do this? And I wonder like, if we would have been colleagues at college longer if, if that had actually existed back. Yeah, then. seriously. I know. <laughs> um, and, and, and so, so <laughs> going to let that go. So, so he's like, careful, because it's heavy, because, you know, it's iron. And I'm like, okay, cool. And so he helps me get into it. It's just a, it's just a tunic. And the sucker weighs like 40 pounds. Yeah. And, and you feel both slightly immobile and invincible. Anyway, yeah, that was that very loose, that very loose tangent. But you, but you bring up combat. So like, even yeah. within, um, even within our game, in my world, we yeah. had an interaction at a pub um i won't get into a lot of details because there's a lot of backstory you had an interaction with one of the npcs of mine um, yes that was not combat as it wasn't physical combat it was more cerebral slash mental combat there was Mm -hmm. a battle of wits of yes right there that also is combat it it doesn't have to be hack and slash right it's right on that line between interaction and combat Right. Yeah. And I think I think you make a really good point with that, because because that is the point that that we want in any of our games, all three of these mechanics. We want exploration, interaction and combat. And like you know, on our little graphic that we use to guide us, we've just lined them up horizontally. But in fact, 
one could think of them as three positions around a circle that keeps be also even in like a Venn diagram in some form or another. Oh yeah. Either, even better. Right. You know? So, cause even I better. mean, like I said, I went through and I outlined my, my world based off of these three mechanics. And that allowed me to see where I mm-hmm. might have some deficiencies to yep. balance the experience better for you and for when other people jump in as well. Yeah. Like Brian right. will play periodically. Right. Well said. Others. So I think Brad, before we transfer over to the interview with Rob, mm-hmm. I think it's worth mentioning if it's not clear by now, the, the issue of mechanics really does rely not merely on the writers of a game if you're using something published, yes. but you know what I'm going to say heavily on the GM. Yep. Right. This is this is that piece where like like this is the piece that I think makes fate so much more difficult than many other games to GM because it's so based on the GM and and responding in these various ways. But but I think that just we need to be upfront about that. Yeah, and I think I think you you said this at the beginning, and it's even clearer now. It's clearer for me. Uh, hopefully, it's clear. I would expect it to be clear for listeners. Um, we're not talking about the dice mechanic here. Nope, not at all. We're using the dice mechanic: two d twenty, narrative, d six, d twenty, fate, whatever, as a means, a vehicle mm-hmm. to apply these mm-hmm. these game mechanics. So within exploration, interaction, and combat, yeah, that's right. where do we need to, you know, how many perception rolls do you need to roll right. within exploration and interaction before right. you potentially may need to move right. to combat? So right. just bear that in mind. You use the dice you are given to mm-hmm. play a game based off of the balance of these mechanics. One could have, and we've both read this argument elsewhere, and I'm sure many of our listeners have too. One could have, a truly enjoyable, compelling game, an RPG that had no dice, that still used exactly these mechanics. Now, I don't think we would enjoy it as much because we truly enjoy the dice element of mm-hmm. role playing. But narratively, especially if you got a strong GM, you could, add, you know, to really push home your point, Brad. One could, one could GM not have any roles and simply respond through these various mechanics and still provide a rewarding dice-free game. Not not my cup of tea, but it could be done. And speaking of that, of strong GMs with a dice mechanic, I think this is a good time that to to transition over to your, I don't even like, it, it is an interview, but it's, when I listened to it, it was a really good discussion mm-hmm. with you two. And um, Rob, I know you'll listen to this. I found it extraordinarily fascinating. One, his background. Mm-hmm. Um, and his life experiences yeah. and then how he took that he took oh, his life experiences and based off of the people that he's gaming with created a world that in many ways satisfied everyone at the, the virtual table with, so, with a lot of different interests oh and I'm telling oh, man. you when I heard this like I said I'm an infant I never thought of working outside of a paradigm um, right. as much now as i did before and i'm gonna that's yeah. my teaser so. yeah well, we don't want to say anything but we'll, yeah. we'll put it this way i after the after interviewing rob i called brad and i'm like so brad just so you know you and i are posers oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and no and i did not disagree no especially no. after i listened all right so with that said let's go over to my interview with rob Rob James Kolomiski is an artist and educator based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Most recently, his work has been selected for inclusion in the 2021 Drawing Discourse Juried Exhibition at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. In 2019, his work was featured at the Open Door 15 Juried Exhibition at the Rosalux Gallery in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the One Shot Exhibition at the Manifest Gallery in Cincinnati, Ohio. He has also exhibited at the 2016 National Juried Exhibition at the First Street Gallery in Chelsea, New York, and the Retrieval of the Beautiful Exhibition at the Painting Center, Chelsea, New York. Rob's work was also selected to exhibit at the Fresh Paint Juried Biannual at Manifest Gallery in Cincinnati, Ohio. His most recent solo show was Liminal at the Manifest Gallery, Cincinnati, Ohio. 
Over the last decade, Robert has exhibited at the Sioux Visual Arts Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Brownsville Museum of Fine Arts, Texas, the Kwandu Museum of Fine Arts in Taipei, Taiwan, and the Dajiang Art Space in Daichung City, Taiwan, Evergold Gallery in San Francisco, California, the Lexington Art League in Lexington, Kentucky, the Foundry Art Center in St. Louis, Missouri, and Max Fish Gallery in New York City, New York. Robert's work has also been selected for inclusion in several publications, including the International Painting Annual by Manifest Press, Cincinnati, Ohio, Weak Painting Exhibition Catalog by Garden City Publishing, Taipei, Taiwan, What is Weak Painting? Review by Tzu Chi, John Garden City Publishing, Taipei, Taiwan, and Studio Visit Volume 8 by the Open Studio Press, Boston, Massachusetts. Rob's first career was an engineer for the Toyota Motor Company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he worked for 10 years designing and producing rapid prototypes in the research and development area. He left that career in pursuit of a dream to become a public art educator. Since then, he has obtained a Master of Fine Arts in Painting from Michigan State University, as well as a K-12 teaching certification. He has taught all levels of college drawing, painting, and design, including the graduate level, as a visiting professor at Michigan State University. He has also taught at South Texas College and is currently a professor and department chair of the Art, Music, and Theater Department at Inver Hills Community College in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he lives with his wife, 12-year-old daughter Eva, and Airedale Terrier Nessie. All right, so I am sitting here with my colleague Rob, whom I actually haven't seen for too many years, but right. we used to work together, and this is a wonderful excuse to finally reconnect. And and Rob, you've been good enough, as we were just talking off air, you've been good enough to provide us with feedback, either about the podcast or the really fascinating things you've been doing with D&D and role playing in general. And so I've got I've got a couple questions for you, but sure. but just just because and I know some of your history, like I remember back at the college you had told me some things and, and I was just like, wow, you, you are one of the most intellectually diverse people I've ever met. And of course, then I left. So we didn't get to continue with that that conversation. Well, we did do some rapid prototyping together. uh, Okay. So to that point, yeah, I really appreciate that. So, so for everyone else who, who doesn't know what Rob's talking about, when I left his college um, as a goodbye gift, just out of the blue, you gave me this gorgeous Colaby Yao manifold space on one of your fairly new 3D printers, right? It was fairly yes, new at yeah, the time. Yeah. And 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 I think I emailed you, but that that was so meaningful to me, Rob. And that has always been on my desk since that time, including including now. And I've often, I I look at that and I think, wow, what, what a good deal I had back at the college and what wonderful people I had to work with back at the Mm -hmm. college. And then I look at that space, that manifold, and I think about you and, and how you are a polymath. I mean, I'd say Mm -hmm. Renaissance man, but I think of you as a polymath because you've not just studied these various fields, but you've been an active an active producer in these fields. So I wonder if you could just give us um, just the the short version of of your you know your creative academic background because you have multiple fields, and then that'll open us up for the context of some of these other questions. Sure. Um, yeah, I actually started my uh, career in a similar <clears throat> not my career, my academic career at a similar school that I'm at now at community college outside of Detroit, and I got a, a degree in auto body design. Um, and this was kind of pre-CAD uh, and then, you know, very early CAD systems. So um, uh, getting that, that short two-year degree um, got me into um, some interesting uh, positions where I was able to um, kind of work my way up the ladder. And uh, I got into uh, Toyota and I worked there uh, for about, yeah. about 10 years and got promoted through the system. And uh, mm-hmm. what I ended up doing at the end was um, uh, running their rapid prototype lab which is how I got into 3D printers. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, producing uh, models for um, prototype cars out of different types of plastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and did that, I don't know, 10, 10 11 years and uh, kind of just wanted to do something else. And that wasn't in the States though, right? Oh yeah, well, I was in Detroit and in, in okay. Ann Arbor, Detroit area, but uh, I did travel back and forth to Japan uh, okay. quite often. So, 
Uh, and I also had to travel to um, uh, Toyota suppliers all around the country. So. Oh, wow. So that was that was really interesting. Great place to work. Uh, I just wanted to change. And yeah. I thought I, I wanted I wanted to teach and I wanted to uh, explore my interest in art. And I left that company. I drove out to Oregon, actually, packed my truck, sold my house and uh, went to school at Portland State University uh, for about a year, year and a half. Um, and I actually studied graphic design, which is kind of the the smart step into the arts because mm-hmm. right? you might you can might get a job. <laughs> so, but I fell in love with painting. I had a really great painting instructor there and I uh, decided I, I want to study painting. Uh, came back and uh, finished my uh, education at Michigan State University. I got a master's degree in, in painting. Uh, and I also got a K-12 um, teaching certificate there as well. Did you ever use that? Uh, I did teach. I taught one year at um, East Lansing High School and in, in um, as I, uh, I filled in for someone who had left, took a leave of absence, um, and then uh, was out of a job again. And uh, that, that's actually what um, spurred me to go to grad school. So I went to okay. grad school right after that. Wow. Um, and then uh, from there, um, I taught at Michigan State as a visiting assistant professor for two years. Um, and uh, I had planned to kind of stick around there, but then the, um, the economic crash kind of happened. Right. And they had a lot of layoffs. So I was uh, I got in, into that and I ended up down in um, South Texas. I taught at a college down there, South Texas College yes. Border, which is a really wonderful, wonderful school, a really great community. Yeah. Um, and then um, came up here to uh, Minnesota and I've been here at Inver Hills teaching for almost 10 years now. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's really cool. Thank you for giving the background yeah. again. I, I mean, that's more detailed than, than, than I was initially privy to, but I think it's important for us to set the context because again, you really, I really think you're a polymath and you've, you've actively walked these various fields, these various disciplines that most people I think conceptualize as being really separate from one another. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, you're one of the people who taught me to know better than that, right? They don't have to be. Okay. So I got to ask you then, how, if at all, does this connect with your interest in RPGs, whether it's D and D or any others? Uh, I would say, I mean, for the engineering part, it's definitely the problem solving, you know, the mechanics, how things go together, mm-hmm. you know, putting, putting together uh, uh, pieces, uh, whether it be a, a dungeon or a character, and mm-hmm. and and watching that that kind of work. Um, but then, you know, the the creative side, the the painting and art side, is definitely the open endedness of, yeah. of that. Um, uh, where you don't know where the adventure is going to go. Um, right. You know, you put those mechanics into motion and, and you roll those dice and, and you know, chance comes in, um, yeah. uh, which doesn't happen in a car, right? You can build a car, you don't want chance. <laughs> One hopes right? not. Right? <laughs> yeah. Things should work, you know, perfectly. But in a, in a game or an adventure or a story, um, you know, I, I'm really attracted to that element of chance. So was, was D&D something that, always attracted you like was was this something like i didn't get into any of this until i was almost out of high school was it a childhood affectation for you something later on yeah i was certainly into it i don't know 10 years on 10 years old on I had a couple oh, okay. of brothers who played um had the original you know all the original books um, mm-hmm. um yeah dm guy did you know it's big three monster manual um mm-hmm player's handbook and and those kids on stranger things when i saw that show and those kids around that table you know that was us you know same haircut <laughs> and candles and dice and music and like that was it and uh and that's kind of when i saw that show i don't know was that four or five years ago and that, that was out um i immediately facebooked my friend i go hey look did you see this scene this was totally us you know and then that's yeah. you know got us got us thinking about playing actually and you've been playing again now for a while uh we actually just got started this past year um over over oh. over covid yeah oh cool okay so one of the one of the few benefits i mean i'm not, I'm not actually not yeah. making a joke here really one of the few okay so so you shared with us a little bit about this game that you're dming and i was telling you i was telling you before we started recording that when i was reading your description when i got to doctor who uh, Brad and I were like, okay, we don't know what's going on, but we have to know more about this because it it sounds 
far more creative than anything yeah. we've come up with. So could you indulge us and just walk sure, us through yeah. what this is about? I'm sort of cursed with an overabundance of divergent thinking, I think is kind of one of my, <laughs> my problems. So I got a lot, go a lot of different directions. Um, but these guys that I hooked up with to play again um, are my original friends that we played nice. with in the eighties. And, and they're all living sort of in and around the Detroit area still. So this ability to connect virtually, which we've never really tried, you know, really mm -hmm. helped us do this and trying out some virtual tabletops and stuff like that uh, was a really uh, something new for us. Um, but yeah, these guys are from, from the old, the old neighborhood. Um, and I wanted to set my adventure there. I wanted to put it in that neighborhood. So uh, we grew up in a place called uh, Mont Clemens. So it's called the Clem, it's the, this is the city. Uh, that it's in. So I grabbed a map off of Google and I modified it and um, I put all the little the little MacGuffins that you chase around at their various houses. So they have to, you know, visit the old places that we used to play, you know, the playgrounds, the high school, you know, all the cool spots that we used to go as kids. So it's been a lot of fun. And I, uh, I, I imagine, I'm sorry, that's well received. Oh, sure. Yeah, they love it. Yeah. And so I can pull in on these virtual tabletops. I just pull in a photo of like the, you know, their old house and, and you can bring in little characters. So I've, I have a lot of fun with the maps, you know, and the, and the little the imagery. Right. Because yeah. uh, I was always attracted to the, you know, the monster manual and the drawings and the artwork in there. I mean, that was that was it for me. I would sit there and draw those characters in my math book, you know, when I was supposed to be doing math. And so, so the artwork in the books was a big hook for me, you know, as a kid. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, the game uh, is, is set in the Clem um, and it's sort of a, you know, uh, it's, it's a city, but it flickers back and forth between those two worlds, uh -huh. uh, kind of between time. So there's a little bit of time shift that goes on. And one of the characters wanted to play a time Lord. Um, <laughs> I was, I'm not a huge Doctor Who fan. I mean, I, I'm aware of Doctor Who. So I had to do a little digging uh, into that and find out what that was all about. Um, but so he found, he went into an old Dragon magazine and found an NPC Time Lord uh, wow. stats. So, so he's playing the Time Lord. So that's how the, uh, the Doctor Who influence uh, came in. <laughs> so I had to, there's a, there's a TARDIS machine that, <laughs> that he's been, <laughs> he's using. He's only used it once, actually, uh, and it connects to the the Stead King's castle. So he's been moving oh back God. and forth in this TARDIS machine. Um, and he, uh, what else happened? Oh, he had a vision where he went back, actually back in time and he saw the, um, I call it the white ingot, which is basically a reference to uh, 2001 Space Odyssey is the, the, the monolith, right? right? So in my game, that's the source of all magic. Um, so oh, wow. they, uh, he sees a, a vision and there's a fight between the uh, sort of the, the ape-like creatures and the tieflings uh, for this course. And, and in the background, of course, it's a, is a, you know, a, a futuristic city. So then that would be the, the planet of the apes, right? It's back, you know, oh, man. in the future. So I like to pull in these little movie references and, um, and I can grab things from, you know, uh, images from movies and put them in there and they, they really enjoy that <laughs> uh, but That's, i have to say the time lord cool. has been challenged <laughs> I, I mean how do you keep a pc like that from not being too powerful for the party yeah it's it's i mean he's only fourth level right now and uh, he okay. gets abilities like every you know if you look in the dragon magazine it's kind of laid out and um, okay about which abilities he gets um and so he um I, he just had a little side quest where he got a, uh, the sonic screwdriver. So yeah. I, I, I homebrewed that for him and it's, it's mostly, uh, kind of opens locks and does, it doesn't work on wood and that kind of thing, just like in the, the doctor who episode. So he's got that as a magic item. Um, but he can move people forward in time, I think 10 minutes back and forth. Oh, interesting. So he's been using it to get information. Um, yeah. So, um, I got to really be on my toes because if he touches someone and they come back and talk to him, okay, what was this guy doing 10 minutes ago? <laughs> or what's he going to be doing you know, 10 minutes from now? Uh, so that's been interesting. So with all of this going on, how, how long do your sessions tend to run? Uh, I would say like you know, two to three hours. Yeah. I got one coming up on Saturday that I'm trying to, to prep for right now. Um, yeah, two to three hours. And then in between... You know, we play maybe once or twice a month and in between yeah. I'll do a solo adventure 
and nice. try to really connect to their to their character. So this this Time Lord guy found the TARDIS and he went out and and uh, was um, trying to solve a mystery around the king that was killed um, in, in the castle. Um, and, you know, the, the main overarching uh, tension is the law versus chaos. So there's yeah. chaos in the Clem, but there's this uh, Lord Director guy who's trying to bring order. Uh, he's building a wall. So there's a lot of uh, kind of, there's a lot of politics going on that I like to bring in as well. Incredible. Where, okay, so the obvious aside, Rob, like, like obviously you've got the one friend who really is into Doctor Who and whatnot, and, but where, and, and you've got the Clem, and, and I mean, I can't ever fault anyone for having a monolith. That's just awesome. <laughs> uh, um, but like, are there, are there sources or just experiences where you find they inform your ideas for this type of thing? Um, sure. Uh, books a lot. Um, one of the characters is a, is a draw elf. So um, he wanted to play that character and he sent me uh, some of the, the Dritz novels. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you've read those. And, you know, I've heard of them. I think Brad's read some. Yeah, they're, they're, they're good. Um, so I read a couple of those and that gave me a lot of like uh-huh. food thought and, and how to engage his character. So, mm-hmm. so in every adventure, I'm, I'm trying to engage them on like the character level, you know, and then, and then the adventure level and try to mm-hmm. tie those in somehow. So he has um, a couple uh, Dro brothers that are hunting him down that he's had to to fight a few times that that kind of found him. Um, um, influences, yeah, I, I would say movies, uh, books, um, artwork for sure. Sometimes right. I'll see a, a great painting, uh, and, and I'll want to incorporate, you know, like like that landscape or that kind of dramatic scene um, mm-hmm. in, in a in a session. Yeah. Okay, so one more question for you. It's it's no pun intended. It's a little more abstract, but but it fits with the theme of of why we're having this conversation. Conversation why we have why we have the podcast. So we are both like presumably a number of our listeners. We are both middle aged guys, but could be gals, could be others. Doesn't matter who. But we're middle aged. We've got families. We've got professions, mm-hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> some of us were into d d or other RPGs when we were little, some of us came later, probably most of us at our age have kind of come and gone, right? Kind mm-hmm. of back and forth as, as life and responsibility and reality dictates. I'm curious what you would say to someone in a similar position, middle-aged, professional, maybe has a family, right? Has a lot of life going on, mm-hmm. uh, who is interested in either getting back into or just maybe getting into for the first time D and D or any of these games, what, what would you say to someone if they came up to you and said, what, what do you think about this crazy notion of me playing? Yeah, I would say, I would say um, jump in, you know, with both feet and it's easier now than it, than it has ever been. Um, uh, I'm new to fifth edition. I'm just learning fifth edition. Mm-hmm. And it's been really, it's been really great. And I, I think um, some of the additions that they've put in with like skill checks and, and challenges and, I think is really interesting and really an improvement and, and easy to learn. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the narrative base of it, I think is great too. It's a lot more um, socially engaging than it was uh, right. when I was a kid. I mean, we were hack and slash dungeon crawler, right. kill right. the monster. Right. And we didn't, you know, maybe solve a puzzle here and there, but there, there wasn't any, uh, mm-hmm. any of the social interaction that, that happened. So I would say it's great, especially for people our age who, you know, tend to be, like you said, very busy. Uh, don't connect with friends very well, um, can be isolated. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of this getting reconnected was because of the isolation of the, of the pandemic right. um, for me and, and some of my friends, um, just, just, you know, reconnecting and having fun uh, together, you know, even if the game, you know, goes south, you know, we, we still had a good time and, and some yeah. good laughs. So. Yeah. Which has really always been the point of playing any of this stuff ever at the end of the mm-hmm. day. Right. Right. And just hanging out with people you enjoy hanging out with. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And back when we played, I mean, it was, it was kind of that, but it was also, co- it was also an escape from oh, yeah. our crazy neighborhood and, and all the crazy families and all that. It was like our little zone that we could be in. And, and you kind of need that as an adult too, right? You can, <laughs> yes. and you need to escape everything and, you know, and have a place where your imagination can, can, can move and, mm-hmm and a little bit of chance. So, yeah, that, that's just, yeah, that's, that's just, that's lovely Rob. And, and how even that escape 
mechanism and and that just play also mm-hmm. simultaneously can bring you together right right yeah. i mean it really is reciprocal when it works and when it works well it does yeah well thank you so much for taking a few minutes with us and uh, yeah. sharing your adventures one thing i wanted to share is today i had two students come in and they they huh? want to start a dungeon and dragons club in my classroom so really yeah, so and are, are you gonna try to make that happen well, we're supposed to have art club, but I think art club might become a D and D club now. <laughs> <laughs> or somehow they'll 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 get intermixed. That's awesome. Well, I want to hear about it when you become the official advisor for <laughs> the D and D club. I'm I'm serious because I I remember one of our colleagues who had who's not at the at the college anymore. It's been some time, but I remember one of our colleagues, and I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, uh, who would play D D out in the fine arts lobby mm-hmm. with some of his students who every yeah. once in a while would show up in chain mail yeah right it's the only time i've ever got a chance to wear chain mail so i built good. some minis for him on the 3d printer too did you really yeah i did yeah oh my god well i'm i'm glad to hear that that printer is getting good academic <laughs> use <laughs> good <laughs> academic use <laughs> all right air quotes no, well, that's really cool. Thank you so much. So good to see you. Uh, really neat news about it gaining traction, right? Where you've got, I mean, college age students who are mm-hmm. discovering this, right? Um, I think it's like you said, it goes to show the durability of what some of these games have to offer us just as humans. Um, mm-hmm. And especially yeah, so maybe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to just collaborative storytelling. I mean, and, right. and you know, with, with chance thrown in and, and I think, you know, just that sense of connection and, um, you know, uh, being with each other around a table, you know, we used to be around a table, now we're around virtual tables, but, you know, we're still making those connections. So. Very cool. Rob, thanks very much. We'll look forward to talking to you in the future. It's been great, Jason. Thank you very much. You got it. I hope you were all able to hear how we said right before the interview, um, the idea of a strong GM and this idea of world building, um, listening to him tell his story about how he got back into gaming, one, and two, based off of what his, all of his friends, in effect, PCs, his friends yeah, who yeah. wanted to play, how he built around Doctor Who and how he built around all these different, he uses his own neighborhood in a way that they all grew up in. He has themes of the old neighborhood built into this game. It's just, it is so, uh, I, 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 I would hate to say it because this, this would be kind of creepy and weird, but I would love to hear an episode that they play or just because of the way he has generated this. And, yep. and when you listen to him talk, yeah, when he, it would be weird, but when you hear him talk too, you can, can't you, you can hear the enthusiasm. Yeah, you can hear, but but it's also, you can tell he would be a great game master, den- dungeon master, because oh. of his natural innate, sorry, Rob, I'm not trying to to, to patronize you. These are serious, this is serious. Um, attention to detail. And mm-hmm. if you listen to him talk about, you know, re- he did, like he said, he wasn't a big Doctor Who person. He went and had to do research. Yeah. Um, oh, man. You know, so and nothing wrong with Doctor Who. It just wasn't. No, no. It's none of our areas. There were so many times, Brad, during the interview where I just want, like, you can't see my facial expressions because this is audio from from the recording. And you can't, you can't actually see Rob's enthusiasm about what he was discussing. But there were so many times, Brad, when I just want to stop and I'm like, okay, hold on. You just have to walk me through this, right? A couple of times I did that, but, but. But I mean, we could have gone for so long and I don't think I I would have tired of him telling us. I think in all honesty, Jason and I have talked about the idea of interviews and integration. This is the first time we are in our episodes. If you are listening in chronological order, you'll notice it. Yeah. If you aren't listening in chronological order, this is the first episode where we've integrated an interview in Yep. Um, because of the theming, Mm -hmm. the theme of that interview matches. But I believe, and I told Jason this before, interviewing him and getting into this whole thing Mm -hmm. could have been a full-on episode without any of us talking we have to have him back on oh i was just gonna Um, say he offered and i i told him please i and rob if 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 you're listening and i and 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 i know you will like brad said 
Uh, please count on it. You made the mistake of offering yep. when you guys are farther along in the campaign to come back and share an update. And we would very much enjoy that. I'm, I am, I am fascinated with his, his, how he did his world building. Oh man. And how it's played out. And so again, um, for those of you that play within a game realm, whether you're playing within the forgotten realms within D and D, whether you're playing purely in the beta quadrant in, in um, mm-hmm. Star, Trek, Star Trek, whether yeah. you're purely like the game you and I are going to play, whether we're playing on the edge of hut space using the edge of the empire, yep. um, you know, what, what if you, what if you took little pieces of each and right. in effect use a dice mechanic and the game mechanic, and it didn't matter the setting between, mm-hmm. if you look at our diagram, mm-hmm. the diagram you designed factor setting mechanics, mm-hmm. you know, where's the setting and how yeah. creative you use the factors and the mechanics to build that setting. And, and that's what we want to do. Yeah. And like you, and like you said, Brad, earlier in this episode, courtesy of the web there. And, and, and like Rob explained in terms of finding like, you know, how do you, how do you, you find stats for a sonic screwdriver, right? So much of this stuff is out there already, isn't it? That, that you don't have to go solo. No pun intended. You don't have to, you don't have to go it alone. Well, no, I mean, you know, just to transition a little bit to our, what we're going to be discussing here yeah. in the future. And that is this idea of, um, using the Genesis, yeah. the FFG narrative dice system. They yeah. took the Star Wars dice system and in effect generalized it so that you can use it in really any realm. They've given you a toolkit to use that system for anything. Right. Right. Much like much like I went back and referenced this before, Dragon Age is an RPG that's out there. They generalized the rules, made them Fantasy Age, and then Will Wheaton took those and mm-hmm. built his um, his gaming world in mm-hmm. order to use the generalized rules. We're mm-hmm. taking that similar path with Genesis, mm-hmm. the gaming system, not the uh, world building right. um, weapon it, from Star Trek. And it goes but, all the way back to the beginning, doesn't it? Right, Gygax based D and D on on his war gaming experience and his mastery and and then and then made something new out of that right yes. this is this is how it works yes i i think it's it was um it was fascinating i think it in effect for me again not being patronizing being serious it helped me to um reevaluate in some ways in a very short period of time yeah. areas where i can improve and and it opened up doors for me Maybe hmm. during this this gaming. Oh no, thanks, Rob. You know, maybe during our game now, there will be things that I'd be more apt to bring up within the context of the gaming system if, or in the game. If 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 my fighter, sorry, if my if oh that's terrible. I, he's not a fighter. Yeah, he is. He's a fighter. Yeah, sorry. I have I have an image of a monk in mind, but my PC is is in fact a, a fighter. In fact, a a, a, a a Cy Eldritch fighter. Um. If, if at some point anyone from Guardians of the Galaxy or Marvel shows up, I'm going to tell you, you're going to, that you're going to have drifted too far. What if Boimler shows up during the game? You know, it's funny you say that. We should walk over to the GM corner. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then I'll, then, then let's, let's have you go first and, okay. and, and talk. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a good um, family friendly, appropriate response to that, but I yeah. will say uh, as we are recording this this past week was star trek day oh, yeah. and uh and i i watched some of the panel i know you and i text a little bit Brad. i watched a few of the panels i just wanted to get the updates and see the trailers for the upcoming shows and so i i know everybody that this isn't rpg per se although in my mind in my world it's let's be honest what what are what are we posting out on our our facebook group it isn't we post dice mechanic we post games out there but we also throw our share of star trek absolutely star Star trek star wars all the pop culture and sci-fi and fantasy we love i yeah yeah absolutely true fair point but i will say i am um i am i'm i'm really looking forward to my surprise to prodigy uh, I think that the animation looks 
incredible. And uh, as you and I have already discussed, I, John Noble is voicing the chief antagonist and he's a wonderful actor, right? Ever since you got me hooked on Fringe way back when, um, I just think it looks very promising. Uh, everything I hear and see and read about Strange New Worlds really impresses me. I, I said to one of my daughters the other day, because she was asking, you know, when is this stuff coming out? Um, a little more to be polite than actually interested, but like she watches Lower Decks with me. Um, uh, she asked, she was asking when it comes out. And I said, well, not for a while. However, and I, I and I'll, I'll, I'll close my, my bit with this, Brad, and then turn it over to you. I suspect that when Strange New Worlds premieres, it is going to become and quickly become the Star Trek show of note. I really think it's going to take canon once once it's out there, I suspect they're going to time it so that it doesn't in overlap too much with Picard, at least season two. But I think once Strange New Worlds comes out, uh, I, what I'm seeing, I think, is a blatant positive attempt to bring in both TOS and TNG elements. Oh, yeah. And if they do that success, right, if they do that successfully, Who's not going to watch that? So um, do I want Boimler to show up in, in our <laughs> D&D game? No, you know I don't like sci fantasy. I just can't get into it. But, um, but I'm happy to have both of those worlds. What, how, if he showed, what, if he showed, what if he showed up as a paladin? Or even better yet, a rogue or a bard maybe. Okay, you know what? Uh, a, a bard named Boimler who had the same personality would yeah. be brilliant. Yeah. In fact, now that I think about that, that should have been my PC. Um, that would have oh, been. We can, we can build yeah. you a second one. You could play two. Yeah, that's got um, NPC or psychic all over it. <laughs> speaking of speaking of PCs, so um, I've been spending time. Oh. Um, two couple things. One, uh, I spent some time in the Edge of the Empire book. It's sitting. I'm pointing yes, for Jason. It's actually. Yes. I'm, I'm afraid of moving stuff because I don't want it to fall over. But I have a um, cascade on your desk. Yeah, Jason, Jay, I started building a character and then Jason and I had a quick convo. Yeah. Um, I think it was the night before the interview, and I realized yeah. how how um I was incapable of building one correctly. No, I didn't no, no, you just it it you use the core rule book and it's just poorly written when it comes to character creation. Yeah. And so we went through and did some of that, and that reminded me I needed to read a little bit more on with the edge of the empire, the the near the edge of the empire system because that's the one we're going to use right um with a little bit of other stuff twinkled in at some point but then i also have the genesis book mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. in the context of of future episodes but i have what's bothered me about our gaming is i haven't found a system i'm comfortable with a lot of people use roll 20 uh, oh, a lot yeah. of people use tabletops uh I, it's out on steam um, tabletop mm. it's a tabletop system virtual okay. system i did some research and i found one called map tool right which i found interesting and i started playing with it and then i want to say i want to say i it was like one of those as seen on tv things sorry folks um it was an ad on facebook and it took me to a place called ark and forge a-r-k-e-n-f-o-r-g-e.com and they are building animated tabletop maps it's a system um they are um continuing to iterate this as they go along um i saw this one and was fascinated by it and um picked it up and as part of that you have to create tokens in effect it's a it's just an identifying token of your character within the map or on yeah. the screen. So I downloaded a prog a, an app called Token Tool. These all run on Mac or PC. And so I found a kind of a humorous picture of Alan Rickman as Severus <laughs> Snape <right. laughs> and, and created in effect a gaming token and then sent a picture of, yeah. of my first attempt at yeah. drawing out a very basic area of where the characters call home 
and then showed little screenshots of Alan Rickman slash but, Jason's character. Lothal. Cause that's the, the, uh, the inspiration for my PC. Yeah. Right. So, so Lothal, your character <laughs> who has a striking resemblance and, and personality to Alan Rickman, um, moving around on the map and a virtualization of it. So, um, that I really started to focus on Jace. What I'm, I'm blanking out. I've been trying to think of it and I don't know what's the Kickstarter. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um, there was another, um, uh, another system. I may have mentioned this before called never ending dungeon. And I'm on the Kickstarter for that, um, which is also very similar virtual tabletops. Um, for some reason, Ark and Forge, because I can, I can store it locally on my machine. I can store the, the files in the cloud so I can access it, multiple machines, multiple platforms. Um, I found it very compelling to allow, once I get the hang of it, and it won't be for yeah. a while because yeah. I have a little bit of time to play with it. Yeah. I want to get to a point where we can actually design animated air quote tokens. Oh, wow for your characters That's so cool. that as you interact it's not like it, it looks a little bit for those who uh, video game it has a little bit of a diablo feel to it um but instead of doing all the combat and everything you do the movement as the dm you can have the fog of war and then you still do and drive the interaction and the combat and so on using our mechanics model. Neat. So, so that's been my focus because um, I feel like that's a natural, I'm not a good drawer. I'm a, not an artist. My, yeah. my daughter is, I am not. So I need help. Um, and even my first attempt within a rich system like Ark and Forge looked like overly simplistic. Um, but, but still neat. Yeah. It's still neat. And it will allow because you've had to visualize a lot of this because I have, that's an area of weakness. I want to make it, I want to make it a little more visual. Like you see with these gamers where they build 3d environments on a table and play. We'll never do mm -hmm. that because we're always going to play this online. Right. Um, but I want that type of experience and I'm right. finding systems that do it. I just need to find the right looking um, I mean, that might be a task for you trying to find the right looking character or us have uh, perhaps someone who has some artistic ability draw us. I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah. You know, speaking of experience, mm -hmm. should we tease what we're going to talk about next week? Yeah. Why don't you, you, you kind of teed it up. Go give them, give them a hint. So we, Brad and I want to spend one more episode, one more week on world building because it's a big topic it's it, it's the biggest topic and it's one he and i we are increasingly immersed in so we thought it might be fun as well as selfishly useful for us next week we're going to jump into the middle of our world building model we've talked about factors up on top and mechanics down below next week we're going to get into the setting specifically we're going to start to talk about the Star Trek setting that we are going to utilize for our port with the Genesis dice mechanic. And it, it's Star Trek, so we're not planning on creating upfront a ton new, but we thought it might be fun for all of you and for us, to be honest, to take our thoughts and share them with one another, Brad and me, riff on each other's ideas and and i mean this honestly take some notes from our discussion and and pull back that curtain to the fourth wall and show you guys how to walk the talk it's one thing to talk about your factors and mechanics but it's another thing to ask okay so how is this going to work in the quote-unquote real world of the game so next week everybody we're going to spend at least one episode We'll see how much time it takes. We're going to share our thoughts minimally next week, talking about the setting. When in Star Trek canon, where, et cetera, et cetera. If it takes another episode, it takes another episode. Maybe then we'll get into the mechanics of the dice specifically. But next week, buckle up. We're pulling back the curtain. We hope you'll join us. And 
and when you think about it, we have, Rob did this. He had to go and figure out how to integrate Doctor Who into a, in effect, a D and D game. We have a toolkit, a system, Genesis. We have all sorts of material. We have the great Modiphius material that we could play off of. There's, I know you, you're not a big fan of it. We, neither one of us are. The old FAFSA stuff, the, um, I can't remember who made the, the intermediary Star Trek, so the Star Trek game. Is it, um, I have the book sitting there. I have the DS9. And the Wasn't it? Generation. Was it Wizards? No. 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 I don't Somewhere remember. We'll have to, point being, we'll have we have again. that. You and I both have um, the TNG technical manual, the DS9 technical manual. This is all yep. data material. Yep. But we also have the shows. Yep. Um, we have mouse. We're going to pull from all these different areas and build a system for us to play let's yeah. just bear in mind we're not building this to go get a license from Paramount. no no and so we're building it because we want to play star trek no. and it would be much easier for us to play our sci-fi games on one platform yeah now we are and well maybe we can, we can close with this brad we are eventually going to bring this to drive through rpg so we can share yeah. it with everybody but but that's that's once we have it done Okay, look, with that, we're, we're going to wrap it because we're already giving away the good stuff. We'll, we'll see you all next week when we're going to get into the setting of world building. In the interim, as always, be well, stay well. We will, we will see you soon.